everybody. Reporting to you again from the Glamour City, Hollywood. So our superpower is our network. So any accelerator, of course, the, the magic is bringing people who know things to help uh, guide these, these young companies. And our network is over half a million Berkeley alumni who live around the world who are very accomplished uh, people who are experts in their fields who we bring to help our founders. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Caroline Winnett, Executive Director of UC Berkeley's Startup Accelerator, Berkeley Skydeck. Welcome to the show today. Thanks for having me, Scott. Caroline, you have a degree in violin performance, and you've also played professionally. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. So I started playing violin when I was very young, six. You got to start young with that instrument. And uh, played it, always loved it. I actually started my college career at Brown University thinking that I would not be a violinist, but the bug just kept gnawing at me. And so I ended up transferring to a music conservatory and getting a violin performance degree and then going back uh, to academia and, and getting my MBA at UC Berkeley. Uh, but that time I spent those many grueling hours in the practice room taught me many wonderful things that applied not just to being a violinist and a performer, but to being a startup founder. So uh, one follow-up question and then a one tie-in question is, uh, do you still play the violin uh, on your free time? And then the tie-in is, what are some of the parallelism or analogies per perhaps between music and startups? Yes, I do play. Um, not as much as I'd like to because of my busy day job, um, but I, I still love to play. That's not my actual violin. That, that's just a, a, a decor of my. My real violin is safely in its, its temperature and, and climate controlled case. But uh, here's what I took away from my violin training, which has served me extremely well. And that is discipline. That is the sense that you must practice or apply yourself to something every single day with almost no exceptions, if you really are going to build mastery. There is no substitute. You, with a violin, as with many things, you can't skip a few days or a week and then make up for it, right? Just practice more on a few days. It doesn't work. The brain has to be trained. The muscles have to be trained. The reflexes have to be trained. And it's the same with the startup. You have to apply yourself every single day to nurture that young company if it's going to succeed. Now, one of the things that we often hear is that a startup or an organization is only as good as a team. However, uh, often as a co-founder or certainly the CEO, it's a very lonely place sometimes. And there are things and challenges that you can't readily share with necessarily certainly the employees. Maybe if you have other co-founders, maybe there's some level of support and sharing, but it's still very much a kind of a individual fight. And to your point, you got to show up and you got to fight every day, but it can be very lonely at times, right? Very, very true. Uh, and one of the great things about an accelerator is that it brings you a community of other founders. So you're very right that the team is critical and, and a good team of founders will lean on each other uh, and be each other's most important people, really, for the duration of, of that founder, founder period. But the, but the CEO role is unique and, and it can feel lonely even if your team is really cohesive and, and really bonded. And so bringing together a group of, of startups so that the founders can connect with each other provides a huge amount of support, learning, and just a feeling of, hey, there's other people doing this, uh, not just me. That's really, really important for the founder journey. 
So we're going to come back to that very important point in just a few minutes. But before that, um, you know, after your education and your MBA program, one of the startups that you co-founded and eventually sold was NeuroFocus. And I wonder if you could briefly tell us about this. Sure. So um, at the time, it was viewed when we started it as a bit of a loony idea, um, which, uh, as many startups are. Uh, we put a headset on your head and measured EEG. Uh, using EEG to measure brain waves, and turned that scientific data and all those squiggly lines into insights for brands about how consumers were reacting to their products and their messaging and their marketing. And what we did that was unique and hadn't been done before was to turn a highly scientific set of data into something that was actionable in terms of a brand that wanted to better understand how people were reacting to their products. And the, the key that, that really made that business take off was that we, we hit upon a big problem in uh, branding and marketing and messaging. And that was that when brands ask their consumers, as they do all the time, what do you think of my product? What do you think of this messaging? What do you think of this ad? People respond and say all sorts of things. And because we're humans, we often say things that, aren't really exactly true, or we think they're true, we're not sure they're true, we're trying to say something that's right. But it ends up often being non-specific and non-directional. And what we came in and said, hey, brands, we're going to help you understand what, you, what your consumers are thinking and feeling without asking them a single question. We're going to go straight to the brain. And obviously, we, we couldn't pull out every single thought out of the human brain, but we could pull out enough that was that provided guidance and direction to our customers. And that's why they loved us. And it's, it's fascinating because, uh, you know, big companies like uh, AC Nielsen and, and others that really mm -hmm. go out and look for this qualitative and quantitative data is that in many ways, the industry is still fairly kind of offline with, you know, surveys and, mm -hmm clipboards and standing in front of, uh, you know, grocery stores and, and retail boxes, mm -hmm. store boxes and asking people questions. And to your point, oftentimes these questions are kind of leading. So, so you know, people who are responding to surveys give responses that th they think that the other person wants to hear, which may not be necessarily congruent with their biometrics, which mm -hmm. oftentimes don't lie. And this is where the EEG data comes in, correct? Exactly. Exactly. And I think people give answers that they think are true. Like, okay, I'm, I, I, I must have an opinion. I'm an intelligent human being. Let me pull something out, out of my mind that, that makes sense. But often we don't know why we like something. We're not aware because so much of what goes into an opinion or a decision is often not accessible by your conscious mind. It's just, it's, it's the sum of a million different things and experiences and thoughts and feelings you have. And it's, it's, your, if our brains were were looking at all of the individual points at all times, we 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 couldn't even get through through a moment uh, without being overwhelmed with information. So our brain it bubbles up to the conscious, and we go, "Oh, I like this." Don't know why. And yeah, that's a great point. And for those that have ever gone to open houses and they've seen a house that they really love, the reality is, if you could measure these things, you could notice that your heart palpitation increased. You could see that there has been an increase in galvanic skin response and certainly, you know, EEG types of uh, signal process signals as well. So mm -hmm. clearly our body tells us a lot more sometimes truthfully than even we are aware of. Uh, switching gears, let's talk a little bit about Berkeley Skydeck. What is it and what is it trying to accomplish? Berkeley Skydeck is UC Berkeley's largest startup accelerator and incubator. We have several programs. Um, we have our program in Berkeley. We also have Skydeck Europe in Milan that, that opened recently. Um, and between those, we have incubation and acceleration of about 120 startups every six months. So about 250 companies a year. What's unique about Skydeck is that we look and feel, we're, we're, we act like a kind of a private startup accelerator in that we bring in the startups, we move them very fast, we have uh, venture funding for them, we have a demo day, uh, we push them very hard to grow as fast as they can. But we are a Berkeley program. 
We're not a separate entity. We're not an affiliate. We're not a partner. We are actually a UC Berkeley program. And our programs are open to founders who are not just from Berkeley. Um, our acceleration programs are open to, to the founders from outside the United States that want to come to Berkeley and launch their businesses, that want to go to Europe and launch their businesses there. And so it's a very unusual uh, organization that way in that we can leverage all of the great resources of UC Berkeley, uh, the alumni, the faculty, the incredible students, the facilities, uh, but we have venture funding. And those companies move very, very quickly as, as, as one uh, needs to make them move for them to truly accelerate. So I think the way the, the program has been architected is very unique and interesting, uh, given the fact that there isn't necessarily a requirement to have had some sort of connection to UC Berkeley, and that really anybody can have accessibility to this uh, accelerator. So I wonder what the thought process was there, as well as how that has mm -hmm. actually distinctively actually increased the caliber, perhaps, of the pool. Sure. Well, it certainly increased um, the number of founders who could apply, right? So the, the way we think of it is that um, our incubation program is open only to UC affiliates. And of course, Berkeley is our main priority. Um, so if you're a student at Berkeley or you're faculty at Berkeley and you have a startup, come to Skydeck. We've got a program for you. But we realize there's a lot of talent outside the United States that wants to come to the United States and launch their products here in our markets. The same way you see Berkeley, from around the world, people come from all over the world to come to our programs and study. And we're an international university. And that's a highly competitive application program. The same for our founders that apply from outside the US. We find incredible talent. Uh, those companies are in markets in, you name any continent, the only continent that we haven't had a founder from is Antarctica. So, um, but every other continent we have startups from. And they apply to our program. We bring them here, introduce them to the US market. And that's been a great way to bring global talent to UC Berkeley and make them part of UC Berkeley. Get them student interns, a, maybe a faculty advisor, um, get them working with some of the facilities on campus and they become part of the incredible Berkeley innovation ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's certainly a lot of pros. Now with us said, when a promising startup is looking for different programs and particularly accelerators, there are lots to choose from. And certainly, you know, a couple that I'm not going to mention by name that have great pedigree and track record, but also just many others, including those that are affiliated with universities, but also private mm -hmm. as well. So what are some distinctive attributes that UC Berkeley's program is providing where people are saying, well, you know, this is a program for us? So our superpower is our network. So any accelerator, of course, the, the magic is bringing people who know things to help uh, guide these, these young companies. And our network is over half a million Berkeley alumni who live around the world, who are very accomplished uh, people who are experts in their fields, who we bring to help our founders. And let me tell you how we do that there, the, and, and what the kicker is. So first of all, as I mentioned, we're a Berkeley program. We're not a for-profit company. We don't exist to make money. We're a Berkeley program. As such, we exist to be a, a global program of, of excellence. Like any Berkeley program, we aim to be number one and to support the public education mission of UC Berkeley. And, and so those are really meaningful goals for Berkeley alums. So here's the kicker. To fund our companies, we, UC Berkeley, don't do venture capital, right? So we, we went and found a fund manager to launch a dedicated venture fund. That's the Berkeley Scottic Fund. That fund invests in our accelerator truck companies and the fund manager per an operating agreement with Berkeley, it's a legal agreement, will donate half of the fund carry back to campus. Fund carry, as you know, is fund profits. So what does that mean? That means that when, when the fund starts returning money, which it will, 
it's a young fund, but those returns will come soon. That fund is returning money to Berkeley. So here's what we do. We call up any Berkeley alum around the world that, that a, a founder might need to speak to. Maybe it's a potential customer or someone who's an expert in a certain area that the founder needs access to. And we say, hey, we have a company. And by the way, if they succeed, Berkeley benefits financially. Will you talk to them? That's almost always a yes. It's an excited yes. It's a yes. I can support Berkeley by talking to a founder at a startup, which is a great thing to do anyway, but I can help support Berkeley's mission doing that. That's fantastic. No other accelerator really has quite that same setup as we do. It's interesting because most uh, elite universities uh, work through the tech transfer office. And of course, as part of that, there are going to be licensing and carries and different kinds of fees associated with it so that they also participate in the upside of some of these startups. So that comes back to the university. But mm -hmm. here, it, it's kind of a hybrid between like a CVC, but then this tech transfer aspects, but you're really aligning these incentive structures. Really, the only ones that's kind of losing out are really the GPs of the fund, but really they're doing it for the reasons of some of the other aspects that you're talking about, correct? Yeah, so the general partner of the fund, uh, who's a Berkeley alum, a, a very, very talented investor, is really happy about this agreement. So when we started the fund, you know, we, we, I looked at Sean and Sean looked at me and we're like, is this 50-50 going to work? Uh, I don't know. Sounds right. Let's try it. Turned out to be great. So Sean is very happy to donate half of his carry because of the incredible value that the Skydeck program brings. And Skydeck and Berkeley are, are thrilled that we have this very talented uh, team of investors now who are helping our companies and supporting them uh, and turning them into companies that can really make a, a, a difference in the world, right? And B, when they exit or go public, then we bring support for public education. So you, you, you said the exact right phrase, alignment of incentives for a, a very important and meaningful purpose. Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense. And again, I think this is very consistent with what UC Berkeley stands for. Now, one of the critical success factors that we've been kind of alluding to is this notion of mentorship, uh, which is that surprisingly, at least statistically, that very few founders actually have formal mentors, but the ones that do have mentors tend to have productivity rise within their organizations. So why do you think that's the case and how is your accelerator helping given the fact that other accelerators also have many mentors and advisors as well? Right. So a good accelerator and, and, and of course, what we focus on a lot is connecting our mentors. We call them Sky Advisors and Sky Mentors to our founders. We spend a lot of time and energy doing that, supporting that. We have a, a very extensive process at the beginning of the batch. Uh, there's a lot of speed dating between the founders and the mentors, 20 minute back to back meetings, about seven or eight of these sessions. Um, and at the end of this process, there's a two sided matching where we match the accelerator track companies with three key advisors. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a labor intensive process. We need to know the mentors and the advisors. Uh, we need to match them up right. We need to set it up right. Um, but the outcome of the process is that these founders get these excellent advisors. And, and here's what's, you know, the, the different thing about Skydeck is, as, as I had talked about earlier, this is all done in the context of a purpose and meaning driven organization. So none of the Sky Advisors or Sky Mentors receive any compensation for what they're doing. There's no payment. Uh, they do this because they love Skydeck, they love working with founders. They like having an opportunity to make a difference in a young company's life. And so when you put people together in that context of uh, doing this because it's meaningful and doing it because you're supporting a great cause that you believe in and it's fun and interesting, that's when really great relationships happen. And we know that that is just about the most important thing we do is, is facilitate those connections between the founders and the advisors. 
And tell us about the feedback that you're getting from some of the cohorts in terms of some of these mentorships and advisorships as well. Uh, given the fact that many startups tend to heavily focus on those that can help with f- f- fundraising, certainly, mm-hmm. maybe mm-hmm. some on the product development aspects, but really business development in terms of accessibility or um, having some sort of hooks into some of these larger corporates or others mm-hmm. that can provide POCs, for instance. Right. So so the advisors are, you know, as I mentioned, they come from, from all sorts of industries. Some of them are investors. Some of them are angels. A few of them are actually active institutional investors. Uh, some of them are startup founders who, who had a, career, a startup career and they just want to give back. And some of them work at large companies. We, we advise our founders, can choose mentors <clears throat> who you feel will really support your company and cheerlead you on. And don't worry so much about their particular area of expertise that will come. You're going to have three key advisors plus access to the broader Sky Advisor Mentor Network, which is 500 people. So don't feel like you have to get, you know, fundraising advice and product advice and this advice from your advisors. Trust us, we will get you that expertise that you need. But find people, and this is, you know, uh, obviously key to having the right mentors, who find people who believe in you, who want you to succeed, who will tell you when you're doing great and tell you when you're not. Very honestly, that's very important as well. Uh, and then once those relationships are set up, because they're not transactional, there's no agenda, we find a lot of very good relationships and advice come out of those relationships. Absolutely, agree. And I think the way I view startups is that it's not a one-time uh, event. It's really oftentimes an iterative process. And what I mean by that is some of the people may initially start out with a certain concept, but then they could integrate or even go into other teams or create new teams. Yeah. But these relationships have longevity beyond that, let's say, initial concept or concepts. So I think that's mm-hmm. very important. I think one of the things that's very important when it comes to accelerator is is the performance and some of the KPIs around that performance. Certainly when it comes to just, you know, let's say return in terms of capital or or the kinds of successes of these startups, many accelerators out there really have dismal results, to be honest. And Kaufman and many others have done studies around that. Only one or two around the world have consistently provided some decent returns. But for the most part, uh, these accelerators, like I said, are are less than stellar. How do you feel that Skydeck is going to be different, especially given the fact that we're in very volatile times in terms of macroeconomics? Yeah. So we measure ourselves in the kind of traditional accelerator way. Um, and those are fund metrics. How is our dedicated fund doing? What's the IRR? <clears throat> What's the financial performance of the fund? How many, how many exits? how many series A rounds, et cetera, raised. Those metrics are doing extremely well. The Berkeley Skydeck Fund is now on its second fund. Fund one was about 23 million. Fund two closed about six months ago, eight months ago at 60 million. Oversubscribed, both funds. Uh, So obviously investors were happy with fund one. uh, So, and fund one was nearly three times as large. And, that's one way we measure ourselves. The other way we measure ourselves is how well are we serving the public education mission of UC Berkeley? And there's some things that are non-financial that don't have anything to do with fund performance. And that is how many startups uh, launch out of Berkeley that go through our program, how many student interns we match with startups. There's we have a huge program of matching interns, student interns at Berkeley to our startups. We have almost 2,000 students a year from Berkeley, and this is undergraduate, graduate, postdocs, et cetera, um, that come to our intern matching events for our founders. So we, we help students find internships. They love that. The startups love it. That's, that's one measure. How do we add to um, the general ability of Berkeley to attract global talent? Um, very important for an international university. And all of those things, we look at very carefully as well. Amazing. Fantastic. 
And and I think that that's distinctively, you know, I think only Ber- Berkeley can do, right? Because if it was a, another private institution, let's mm-hmm. say, uh, they're going to have very different set of metrics and they're going to be looking at it from a different point of view. But the fact that you're thinking through talent pool, talent development, and also mm-hmm. uh, ecosystem that has a Berkeley footprint throughout the world, and of course, ability to create this mechanism back so there is a win-win for both the institution as well as this community is, is pretty significant. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's um, quickly talk about maybe one or two, let's call it case studies or maybe startups that you want to talk about that came through Skydeck and how the program has really helped them to get to where they are today. Mm-hmm. Sure. So probably the most recognizable one uh, is Lime, the mobility company. They were part of our incubation program some years ago. Um, sadly, we we hadn't launched the fund yet, yet so we don't have a slice of Lime. Um, but I think we were we were helpful to them. They were somewhat mature when they came to our incubator program, uh, but they definitely worked with us to help um, their network development. And of course, we're, we're not taking a lot of credit for that, but they, they've gone on to be, of course, a great success. Um, in terms of companies that went through our accelerator track that have been invested in by our fund, um, we have a lot of exciting stories of companies that they're still fairly young because the fund is only a few years old, um, but very promising. Several companies in battery technology that could be quite transformative. Um, one, uh, several, uh, two of these from Berkeley itself, I'm um, doing pretty advanced battery uh, technology, one of them called CoreShell and another one called Chemex. And then in terms of companies a little bit that came from outside the US to launch here in the US have been a great success story company from Armenia called CRISP that makes um, a sound reduction technology. I highly recommend you look it up. It's an app that you can add to, to any of your devices that will reduce background noise, um, which turned out to be timing wise, pretty good deal because then we all started living on Zoom and that became very, very popular. And then we've had uh, a couple of exits. Uh, one of them, a company called IOTA Biosciences that was founded by a Berkeley faculty, uh, two Berkeley faculty, that was a highly technical company um, that was one of the first exits for the Berkeley Skydeck Fund. And as you can see, these are fairly deep tech companies. One of the great things about having this incredible network of faculty, students, alumni, you know, any expert anywhere, is that Skydeck is able to take companies in every single industry. Whatever it is, we've got it. There's an expert in our network that can help. So everything from life science, hardware, robotics, uh, we have a, a company's blockchain, anything you name it. And we can definitely help you if you're hard tech and science, because of course at Berkeley, we have that kind of expertise. Great, terrific. Now, in the beginning of the conversation, you talked about violin and how it it's an art form that requires daily discipline. And that advice also extends to entrepreneurship as well, especially for co-founders and CEOs. I wonder if you could share any other lessons learned or insights with those that are listening. Sure. So, you know, I, I, there was a, a question that often comes up of what, what do you wish you knew as a founder that you, that you know now? And you know, I, I have a different way of thinking about that now than I, than I used to, because what I would really say is what I wish I had been uh, as, a, as an early stage founder uh, that, that I am now, I think, more. And that is having the unshakable big vision. So all founders have a big vision, right? They're going to leave their day jobs. They're going to Put, put their entire lives on uh, on a, a very shaky ground uh, to build something that they believe is really important and either doesn't exist or is not being executed well in the world. And they all have that big vision. And we're often counseling founders, keep your eye on that vision. Don't let anyone make that vision fade. Or, or, or instill doubt in that vision. Keep that big, big vision very clear and at the forefront and don't let anyone talk you out of it. 
that's the thing that I think I, that Mm. I would always advise. And I often advise founders of young companies to keep in their mind. Well, I don't think we have to look very far beyond the likes of, you know, Steve Jobs and Elon Musk, uh, Jeff Bezos, to just name a few Bill Gates that have Mm -hmm. exactly that uh, hypervision that you're talking about. And the ability to not be deterred no matter what others or the macroeconomic or the environment tells them otherwise. So with that, I have been joined by Caroline, Caroline Winnett, Executive Director of Berkeley Skydeck. Thank you for joining today. My pleasure, Scott. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.